He is also the creator world. As we looked at last week, He's the Word of God. Before God ever created, the Word was settled, and Jesus Christ came to earth, who is the Word of God, and we see Him in His deity. Jesus Christ is 100% God. But in this chapter, we see His humanity. Jesus Christ is the uh, Word of God, but He's also the Son of Man. You see some things about this, and these stories are not, uh, uh, we know these stories, we have read these stories, and, and of course the first miracle of Jesus Christ, the first miracle recorded in the beginning of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, we find in John chapter 2, the miracle of turning the water into wine. And so we have this story here. I want us to read, <coughs> excuse me, the first 11 verses here and look at this passage of Scripture and how that we can apply it to our everyday life and apply it to us here yet even today. The Bible says, In the third day there was a marriage in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Canaan of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Now again, the book of John, and I need to print some more off encouraging you as I, I handed out last week and I'll print some more. I believe there's a few of the, of the uh, uh, Bible reading uh, in there. Every chapter, every book of the Bible, every chapter of the Bible is listed. And if you read a chapter, uh, cross through it, uh, circle it, underline it, whatever uh, you, you choose to do. And as I mentioned last week, I will take and, and I will put a, just a line through it. It and it, it, when I read that chapter, those chapters, if one chapter has really meant a lot to me and really something jumped out at me, I will take and circle it so I can go back to that chapter. And then if it was in the first half, I'll put a line on top. If it's in the second half, I'll put a line in the bottom. And, and uh, so just kind of as a quick reminder to look at. And I don't take a pad of paper and write down. Sometimes I, I have in the past, but I, I find myself getting distracted uh, with that. And, and I'll put Put notes uh, in the Bible as well, but uh, I pray that you'll just read. I'm not saying that you need to read through the Bible in a year, but you ought to read the Bible each and every day. It would amaze you when you look at that at that sheet at the end of the year, saying, "I can't believe I've read this many chapters of the Bible." And the Bible says, "The Lord Jesus Christ says, My word will not return what void." So everything you put in is going to help you. And so I'll, I'll print some more off and, and encourage you uh, to read. And so if you read chapter 2 and chapter 1 of John, you can put a line through those. It's a great start. But I always encourage new Christians and, and really all Christians to read the book of John. Because John is about the Lord Jesus Christ. It is written very simplistic and it's all about Christ. And so, as we looked at in John chapter 1, you can, uh, as you enter John chapter 1, it gives a convincing evidence of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
that he is the God man. But then when you come into chapter 2, you see two really pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to concentrate on the first one, and, uh, but I will mention the second one as well. Uh, he is shown at a wedding in verses 1 through 11, and then Jesus Christ goes to the temple in chapters 12, 12 through 25. In uh, the one, you find Jesus Christ enjoying this wonderful, wonderful time of marriage. But in the second one, you see Jesus exerted his authority as the Son of God to cleanse the filth from the Father's house, from the temple. Now let me just tell you what took place. He says, listen, you've turned my Father's house into a merchandise. You've turned it into money changers. It wasn't that what they were doing, there was no problem selling the doves, selling selling the, the, the lamb, selling the oxen. There was no problem with that except for they were using it as a prophet. It was a time of Passover. They're going to, uh, to sacrifice. And he says, listen, you're selling them trying to make a profit. You're using God's house to make a profit here and that's wrong. He says, that's not what it's for. You are to sell them at the cost that it is to raise them. You're not to make a profit on this. Now, if you want to go to your home, want to go to your farm, and you want to sell and make a profit, that is fine. But not here in God's house. Let me also add this. There's a lot of times young people will come up and say, hey, I have a fundraiser for my school, and, and uh, would you be interested in supporting that? They are not changing, cha turning the house of God into a money changers. And so I'd encourage them, hey, catch me out in the hallway or something, and, and, and any time that they come and ask me, I'll say yes, or go ask my wife, and, and uh, uh, we'll order something from you, and, uh, uh, and they have fundraisers. That's not what it's talking about here. But they were using it for a profit. I believe that the house of God, I believe the, uh, the, the church still ought to be a place where we come and worship where we can come and serve, where we can come and, and really spend time with the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see these stories here. We're going to focus on the first story, and it looks at Jesus Christ as the Son of Man. Now, we look at His participation in the events of life. In verses 1 and 2, it says, In the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Now, if you jump back and we had read all of chapter 1, it's the beginning of Jesus Christ calling his disciples. One of the disciples is Nathaniel. Nathaniel is from Canaan. And so uh, he is here with, with the Lord Jesus Christ. They've been invited to this wedding. Now, you look at the circumstances here. A wedding always is a huge social event, especially in those days. How many of you, uh, you know, wedding? It's supposed to be a wonderful, fun, joyous occasion. You have two families coming together and uh, a husband, a bride, and a groom. And so uh, you have a wonderful time here. Now, uh, in those days, this festivity uh, lasted as much as a week, two weeks' time. Even sometimes longer, the, uh, depending on uh, the status of the family financially as well. So they would throw an, an, an elaborate celebration for a wedding. And so here they are at this wonderful, wonderful wedding. Now, we're not told who is getting married. We know that Mary is there, which means, and she's really in a position where she's helping out, she's involved, which means she's probably family to someone here. It doesn't tell us, and, and to, be, to be honest, it doesn't really matter, other than the fact Mary is there. It could be a brother's child, it could be a sister, that we don't know. But we know that she is there. The Lord Jesus Christ is also there. And so you see that the, the, her activity in verse 1, in the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Verse 3, And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Verse 5, His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. 
So this would give you a sense of authority here at the wedding. She's not just some uh, visitor said, hey, here's a friend, here's someone wants you to come, and that person walks in and just takes over. And so uh, she is there, but the circumstances here, everything is going wonderful, and then they run out of wine, and we'll talk about that in a sec. Now, let me say this about this, being the son of man. If this scene teaches us anything, it tells us that Jesus Christ wants to participate in the common things of life in your life as well. It's not just the church house, it's every area of your life, the Lord wants to be a part of it. Jesus Christ could have went someplace else. It's the beginning of his ministry. He could have been any place, but he came to this wedding. He was also invited here. So Jesus isn't again just for Sundays. He desires, but not only does he desire, the Lord deserves to be a place in your life. The Lord deserves to be in every area of your life. You see, he is either Lord of all or he isn't Lord of all at your life. Think about it. Acts chapter 10, verse 36. I'll read this, Acts 10, verse 36. Now, the Bible says, that says, the word, which, uh, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all things. Again, He is either Lord of all or He isn't Lord at all in your life. He ought to be Lord of everything in our life. Then you see the call. Now, Jesus is here by invitation. Someone uh, invited him. How many of you have ever got an invitation to a wedding? And it has on their RSVP. I have a, a, a fellowship meeting next, next month, and, and it has on there, please let me know whether or not you're going to come or not going to be here. We're trying to prepare the meal. And, uh, uh, and so I uh, responded to him, let him know that I'll be there, uh, but don't, don't worry about anything to eat for me. And uh, so I, I let him know that I was there. So in RSVP, uh, Jesus Christ was invited. Uh, someone uh, thought of invited him, so he came to this. Now, again, and, and we'll jump into much more here in a minute, but listen, never be guilty of attempting to exclude Jesus Christ at any area of your life. Every area of your life, you ought to invite Him. God, this isn't important, so I'm not going to bother you. I hear that often. A pastor, I was, going to, I was going to tell you, but I didn't want to bother you. That's an insult to me. Why? This isn't a job to me. This is my life. I want to be a help. I want to be an encouragement. And so when you have the Lord Jesus Christ, you ought to wake up every morning and say, Lord, uh, I'm beginning my day today. Whether it's your drive to work or you're sitting there in the morning with a cup of coffee or tea or chocolate milk or milk or whatever it is and say, Lord, I pray that you'll be with me today. I pray that you'll, you will uh, protect me, that you'll guide me. Lord, you know that I'm going to be out and about in public. You know that I'm going to have to deal with some people today. Lord, I'm going to ask something of you. Would you please guard my tongue? Please. Let it only say what is honoring to you. I see some of y'all laughing, saying, oh, yeah, I've been there. Shouldn't have said that, should have I? You know, if we would think before we speak, it would save us a lot of problems, wouldn't it? If we would pray about something before we act upon it. How many of you have ever asked God to protect your tongue? Me alone? Well, <laughs> glory, I'm the only one that has a problem, Lord. I'm sorry. If you're going to judge him, wait until I'm out of here. Okay, thank you, Lord. The fact is, is that, Lord, give me safety as I travel. Lord, give me safety uh, today. I believe that he ought to be a part of every, every aspect of our life. Never be guilty. Now, they invited Jesus Christ to the wedding. You say, well, it was an important day, but they did not leave the Lord Jesus Christ out. Think about this. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God? And ye are not your own, for ye are what? Bought with a price. Therefore glorify the, the Lord in your body and spirit. We need to glorify the Lord. If He, if, if he owns us, he ought to be a part of our life. 
You know, too many lives Jesus has left standing outside. How many of you have done this? I know I've asked the question, but humor me. You invite someone to your house and you say these words. I just want you to make yourself at home. How many have ever said that before? If you're honest, raise your hand if you've said that before. You are a liar. Flat out, straight out, I'm just going to tell you, we have done it as well. We are liars. If a door is shut, it is to remain what? Shut. Hey, they said I could make myself at home. I wonder what's behind door number two. <laughs> no, no, no. If it's shut, it stays shut. You don't go in those rooms. You told me to make myself at home, therefore I'm making myself at home. No, it's what you're saying is you can be comfortable in this area, but don't depart from here. Don't go staggering. I wonder what's in here. I, I threaten uh, teenagers once in a while. I say, hey, I'm going to come and visit you. I'm doing a room inspection. Their eyes go like this. No, no, no. Uh, Dad, Mom, can we put locks on these? I really want to lock this door. I do not want them. To, I mean, you don't even want your parents to see the room, let alone have pastor come and look at this room. Let me say this. Is what we are saying many times is that he is my Savior but he's not my Lord. He's my Savior. He saved my soul and take me to heaven, but he's not the Lord of my life. The Lord Jesus Christ ought to be the Lord of absolutely everything in our lives. So you see, he is participating in the events of life. The Lord Jesus Christ wants to be a part of every area of your life. You see Christ's consideration. Notice that when he was called, Jesus came. In all of the events of life, the child of God, the Christian, never needs to worry whether or not the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come when you call him. The Bible says, call upon me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I've also uh, mentioned the verse, and you know the verse, we have not because we ask not. When we call upon the Lord, the Lord is going to come. The Lord is going to answer. The Lord is going to be there. Why? Because He cares for us. He will answer us and move in our each and every need. Now you get to the meat of this, this story here. You see uh, His power in the events of life. Look at verse number 3. And when they, were, and when they, want, and when they wanted wine... The mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Now, I find that interesting when I read that, Brother Potter, and, and you look at the Greek, and you look at translation and all that, and, and the Lord, Mary didn't say, hey, 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 Jesus. I think they're out of wine, or they're out of wine. She said, hey, Jesus, they're out of wine. She, she spoke to him and said, Jesus, they're out of wine. And, and, and you see some things here, you see the problem here. Now, uh, sometimes uh, during these festivities, they, they ran out of wine. Now, this doesn't seem like much of a problem to us, but the Jews, it could be really disastrous. It could be a major problem. First, it was a matter of honor. The bridegroom was responsible for providing adequate food and beverages uh, to take care of the whole party. And, 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 and wine, many times, is an indicator in the Bible of joy. It was a joyous occasion. And now they're out of it. Think about it. Uh, I've said to my wife, listen, we're having a, we, we have this discussion. And us husbands and wives have these discussions once in a while. And I'll say, hey, we're having a preacher's fellowship. Here's about how many people I think we're going to be here. And she goes, well, okay. Now, a serving size is this. And I say, honey, we're talking Baptists here. Serving size is thrown out. Well, if we bought this much, it should take care of them. I said, I want to feed an army. I would rather have a bunch left over than run out. She said, no, we're going to be fine. So one time I, I let her do it and we ran out. That was not good. That, that was really, uh, hey, did you get something to eat? No, you, th th it was all gone. 
Now, uh, that's kind of embarrassing. Well, wouldn't you agree? So here is the, 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 the wedding, and they're out of drink. Now, I, I, when I was in Iowa here a couple weeks ago, and, and uh, Kyle was doing the wedding, he was a cousin, first cousin of my nephew and on, my, on my sister-in-law's side, and we were talking, he pastors, and, and you could tell he was nervous. I could tell he was nervous because I'm a pastor, and I, and I involved in this. And I went up to him and said, Kyle, you did a great job. He goes, I was so nervous. I was so nervous. I said, you did a good job. Nobody knew what had happened except for you. And he said, did you catch any mistakes? I said, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I caught one. I said, it was, it, was, it was a good wedding. And I said to him, I said, you know something I have found? I would rather do a funeral than a wedding. Now, I love doing weddings, funerals if it's a saved person. But weddings are filled with emotion. You have the bride's family, mom. You have the groom's family, mom. And I talked to him for a few minutes, and, and I said, here's what I always do. I said, I always sit, the, the, the family will come up, and I'll say, man, it's so good to be here. I'm so thankful in this rehearsal. We are going to have a wonderful time and a wonderful meal is being prepared, but I want to just talk to you and begin this and, and just talk to you a few things and say a word of prayer uh, for you. And I've learned a lot of things and I put a lot of notes down and I say, no, listen, usually the bride's side is here. The groom's side is here because the bride stands on this side. The groom stands on this side. And I say, listen, I've so enjoyed getting to know your your children, and of course, some of them I've known for a long period of time, and I've known you, and, and you have raised some beautiful, beautiful children. I've enjoyed my time in the office talking to them. We have spent some wonderful time in fellowship, and they have shared with me exactly what they want in their wedding. They've told me everything, and so I want to ask a favor of you. I'm only going to take orders from the bride and occasionally maybe listen to the groom because he's out of it. But mom, I appreciate you. Mom, I appreciate you. But they've already told me what they want. You ought to see the looks that you get. Like, I'll say, listen, they've told me what they want. Let's not try to live our wedding through them and then the looks even get worse. And we have had where, you know, uh, all of a sudden a bride is back there in rehearsal. She's crying and she's, she's all upset. And I'll go back and say, what, what's going on? Well, I want to do it this way. Mom said I have to do it this way. So just do it. And I'll say, no, we're going to do it the way you want it done. Let's do it this way. And we will have a good time. Now, I'm not against it. You say, oh, you're the mean pastor. No, I want them to enjoy. This is the most important day of their life other than salvation. And so uh, most young girls have dreamed about a wedding most of their life. Pastor Letson, his daughter, it'd be his granddaughter, uh, they had in school, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she brought her baby doll, a little stroller, and she says, I want to be a mom. I thought that's pretty cool. But, you know, I, uh, my boys, they weren't playing with dolls when they were young. But Adeline, she's got her doll. And the other day I looked and there's, here's, a, uh, here's a baby wipe and a baby wipe and a baby wipe and a baby wipe and another baby wipe. And I said to my wife, I said, what are all these? And she'd pulled wipes out because she was going to change her baby's diaper. She had to make sure that it was clean, so she pulled all these wipes out. But for the most part, young girls, they grow up dreaming about a wedding, dreaming about this wonderful time. And so it's a wonderful time of festivity. I could almost imagine word came out, hey, they're out of wine. I knew he was a loser. I tried to tell my daughter he was a loser. I tried to tell him not to marry them. I tried to tell you that you should, you know, and how, how many of you have ever had a problem at your wedding? We got married in Fairfax, Virginia to my wife. It'll be 35 years. And we, uh, we here in Michigan, we uh, checked all of our sizes for, for, for tuxedos, the same place as in, in Fairfax. And so all the order was sent there. We got there every single crotch of the guy's tuxes were ripped out. I'm thinking, seriously, what did we do? Get the bad batch? 
<laughs> this is not a good thing when you're going uh, in a wedding. And so the ladies, uh, you know, back then they pulled their little sewing kits and they're trying to fix everything. And, and mine were like this. I'm thinking, man, that's not going to look good <laughs> in a wedding. And they're trying to let things out and, and stuff. And think, if this is the worst problem we have, that's not a problem. This is good. But you, you think about this wedding. It is a wonderful, wonderful time of celebration. It's a wonderful time of festivity. You know, to run out of wine again would cause embarrassment. So when you look at this, life doesn't always go as we had planned it. There are times when problems arise and troubles come that are completely out of our control. So what do we do? Well, we bring it to the Lord. In Ecclesiastes 2.23, it says, For all his days are sorrows, and his travail grief. Yea, his heart taketh not rest in the night. This is also vanity. You know, it's good to know that when our problems do come, and they will come, that we can take them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Those around us, may, uh, they may see them as nothing, but the Lord Jesus Christ takes them seriously. They have a problem here. They are out of wine. Now, what is the procedure here? Now, in this time of trouble, Mary shows us just what we need to do when troubles arise. I can almost see her saying, Jesus, I need to talk to you. Son, come here for a moment. She says, we're out of wine. And servants, do exactly what he tells you to do. This is my son. His name's Jesus. You find the command there, and then we find a phrase that I want to clarify for just a moment. If you look at, at your Bible here, and in verse 5, And his mother saith unto, the, or before this, verse 4, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not come. Now, how many of you have read that and thought, Why is Jesus talking to his mother that way? Because... When I was growing up, if I said, woman, I had a different response than, okay, you go to time out. No, we called it a coming to Jesus meeting. Mom would take care of it. Dad would come, take care of it. Was never a joyful time. It wasn't, it, that, that, that personal time with my parents was not a joyous time. And so how many would look at this passage and say, it's a derogatory, he's talking down, because if someone walked up to you and said, woman, how would you take that? Say what? Yeah, yeah. Now, they're like, yeah, don't look at me, I don't say it. No, no, no. Jesus wasn't talking down to his mother. We have made the name woman. What was Jesus saying? You could translate it, my lady. What would you have me to do for you? What is it that you desire for me? He wasn't talking down to his mother. First of all, if he had talked down to her and looked at her with disrespect, that would be called sin. Jesus never sinned. So when he spoke to her, it was out of reverence. He says, my lady, woman, what would you have me to do? Mine hour is not come. And she says, listen, servants, just do what he tells you to do. Now, let me say this. The Bible says that if all of the things and works that Jesus Christ had done, the volumes of the world could not contain them. Jesus had obviously shown his deity in front of his mother. His mother looked at the Lord Jesus Christ. She's 30 years old now. She knew the power of Christ. She says, hey, they have no wine, Lord. And he says to the servants, you need to listen to him. You will also find something interesting in Luke chapter 2, verse 51. This is the time when they went to the temple. He was left behind. They went back and found him. In verse 51, it says that he was subject unto them, which means he was subject to both Mary and Joseph. He listened to them and he obeyed them. This is the only command in all of the Bible that you will find from Mary to, his, to, to her son. 
She says to him on this, uh, she says, they have no wine. She's given him a command and saying, listen, whatever he tells you to do, that's what you're to do. So you see this procedure here. For those who feel that Mary is to be reverenced, adorned, worshipped, and obeyed, this is an excellent advice for all of us. Just do what the Lord Jesus Christ says. If you look at, look at Luke chapter 1, verse 28 and verse 41, the angel said, Blessed art thou among women. Elizabeth said to, the Lord, to, to, to Mary when she found out she was pregnant, she said, Blessed art thou among women, not above women, not over women. I know the Catholic Church puts a, a very high priority on Mary and how we need to pray to Mary. We don't need to go to Mary. We just need to go to the Lord Jesus Christ. Mary was a blessed woman. Let's, let's take nothing away from Mary. She was a blessed woman. God used her for uh, the delivery of His Son. And so you look at the procedure here. Now, a lesson is very clear. When problems arise and, and troubles really upheave our lives, the best thing that we can do is just simply go to the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, would you take care of this? Would you give me peace? Would you give me comfort? Would, would you help me with this? Would you give me understanding here? Would you answer it? Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to him. You know, how about uh, cast all your care upon him? We know 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. But the verse before that, it says, cast all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Just give it to Jesus Christ. When we keep it, when we hold it, is when problems arise and problems come. Romans 8, 28, we can trust in him. In Acts 16, 31, we can believe on Him for salvation. We can believe on Him for every other area of our life as well. Now, you see His, perform his performance here. Now, in verses 6 through 9, Jesus took the commonplace and made it extraordinary. He can change any situation given to us. How many of you have ever sat back and said, I don't know how God's going to work this out, but it's His. And then he works it out in an extraordinary way. And you say, wow, that was a miracle. He's still a miracle performing God. He still cares for us. He still loves us. He still wants to help us. You see, it was unconventional. Water to wine. Now, Jesus won't always do what we want him to do. But he'll always do what's best for us. In this situation, he took care of the problem. Again, as I mentioned, wine was a symbol of joy. Think about the three Hebrew boys. They are standing before the king, Nebuchadnezzar, and he says to them, if you don't bow down to, uh, to, to, to me and, and, and worship, then uh, you're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And he says, let it be known unto thee, O king, we will not worship thy gods. He says, our God is able to deliver us, but if not, he is able to deliver us. He said, listen, our God can deliver us if he wants to. Now, could have Jesus Christ, could have God sent an angel to protect them before they went into the furnace. But he didn't. He let them go into the furnace. And did he not say, listen, did we not throw three into the fire, but I see four, and the fourth is like unto the Son of God. You see, God might not always take you from the situation, but he's always going to be there for you during the situation as well. And so the problem and the performance of the Lord Jesus Christ, it was also uncommon. It was uncommon. You look at verse 10. And saith unto him, the, the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. The governor of the feast is surprised at the quality of this new wine. It was a, a, an uncommon thing. Now again, just because God did something in the past doesn't mean that He'll do it the same way in the present or even in the future. 
God always works things out for His glory and our good. He always does this. Don't try to... Now listen, and, and again, I'm guilty of this. Now listen, God, I have a situation. And here's how I want you to take care of it. And God laughs. I can just imagine God laughing. Every time I do that thing, yeah, I know, Lord. That was another stupid thing I said. No, we just take it to the Lord and say, God, how do we deal with this? Even, now listen, I'm not even talking about trials. Lord, I have a decision to make. It's, it's a wonderful thing, but I want to have peace. I want to make sure that the decision is right. And we ought to ask the Lord to give us comfort, give us peace. Help us to, 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 to enter that with, uh, tell them to open the doors. You know, many may question why so-called good people suffer. I have to say, I don't know. But God does. I think of Job. Why did God allow Job to suffer other than it's a tremendous, tremendous example to us that it doesn't matter what happens in life, you can still trust the Lord. He's going to take you through this. It was also unbelievable. Now again, in verse, in verse number 9, When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants. The servants here. The servants knew what it was. He says, where did you get this good drink? Where did you get this good wine? And the servants are like, it's just water from the well. Jesus said, fill it up with water, dip out of it, take it to the governor. And the governor tasted it and said, this is the best I've ever had. This is always served first, and then you give the, the, the store brand second. Listen, the governor didn't know where it came, but the servants did. Why? Because when Mary said to the servants, do as Jesus said, they did exactly what Jesus told them to do, and they looked at it and said, you may not know where it came from, but we certainly know where it came from. It came from the Lord. You see, when God does something extraordinary in your life, when God answers a prayer in your life, the world may not understand where it came from, People may not know where it came from, but you certainly do. You see, you're the one that had to bear the weight of the water pots. You're the one that had to make sure that it was there. You're the one that has spent time calling upon the Lord. And all of a sudden, God answers and you say, Wow, what a mighty God we serve. What a wonderful God that we serve. You see, nobody in this world may understand what you're going through, but the Lord does. And when He moves in your time of need and turns your darkness to day, when He lifts your burden and shoulders your load, you know it and you will never forget it. Listen, if God has done something in your life, you ought never forget it. Starting with salvation. Starting with your relationship and, and, and your wife, your children, and, and what God has given to you and what God has done for you. But how often do we just forget God? Faithfulness is not important in our day and age anymore. Faithfulness of the Lord, faithfulness of the things of God. Listen, God has blessed every person in this room God's been good to. We ought to show forth. Listen, I don't serve God because I have to. I serve God because it's a delight in my life. I look at all that He has done for me. Listen, God understands. The last thing here is Christ's provisions. His provisions in the events of life. Look at verse 10 and 11. The Bible says, And saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. The word miracles here, let me say this as well, also means signs. This beginning of signs to authenticate His message, to authenticate who He was. 
But you look at the provisions here. He provided that which pertained to the flesh. Now think about this, wine. He gave them just what they needed in their immediate circumstances. Pastor, I have a need. I have a financial need or I have a physical need. Oh, God's not, in, He's not interested in those things. God's interested in everything in your life. God's interested in your diet. God is interested in... Listen, think about this. The God that can hold the galaxies knows how many hairs on your head. He knows everything about you. And if God has all of this and is concerned about this, we have a loving God. We have a God that cares about everything. Never be afraid to take absolutely everything to God in prayer. Children do. We were teaching Addie to pray, her parents are, and then when she's there, we will lead her in prayer. Dear, dear, Jesus, Jesus. And she'll go through the prayer, amen. And so then the other day, I said, okay, it's time to pray. And she started just babbling. And we, we say, bless this food to our body. Give us a wonderful day. And in the babbling, she's throwing words in there. Body, watch, care. And, and so she got done babbling, and if you know her, she likes to talk. And so we listened to her, and she looked at us with a smile, and then I said amen, and I led in a prayer. And You said, what do you think she was doing? I think in her mind she was praying. And I just believe God heard her. If God listens to me. He certainly can understand her. But listen, if we had the faith of a child, we'd have so much more in our lives answered. If we would just bring things, that's what the Lord said, if we had childlike faith. You see, in, in Philippians 4, turn over to Philippians 4 for just a moment. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now the key word in that verse is all. Now, Brother Potter, you do study, word study, you bring that out. And I know Brother Steve, you study and I study and... So do you know what the Greek definition and translation of that word all is? All. All. He says in this verse, he says, But my God shall supply all your need, not your lusts, not just your desires. He's saying what you need, God is going to provide it for you. What do you need today? What is it that you need? You know, you take the, uh, the, 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 the children of Israel in the, in the wilderness for 40 years. Every single day, God brought them manna. But there's one thing they could not do. They could not keep leftovers and put it in the refrigerator. They couldn't keep leftovers. Why? If they kept it in the bowl, the next morning, the Bible says that it, it, it rotted. You see, God gave them what they needed that day, every day. God will supply your need today. You look at this passage of Scripture in John chapter 2, and the fact is they had a need, and Jesus took care of that need. But that was just the beginning. There's thousands and millions of people that have needs every day, and do you know what? God provides that need. What is it that you need today? What is it that you're desiring God? Think about the uh, widow in 1 Kings 17 of Zarephath and her meal barrel. Uh, and she went down and, and, and Elijah said, listen, take and make me a loaf of bread. Make me something to eat. And she says, listen, this is all that I have. I'm ga getting some sticks. I'm going to make myself a meal. And then my son and I were going to die because this is all we have. And he says, listen, just do what I told you to do. Go ahead and 
make me something to eat. Don't worry about it. And the Bible says that her barrel never ran out. Her oil never ran out. Why? Because God took care of her need. We just take it to the Lord. You uh, think of Elijah by the, by the brook. God provided each and every day. You see, these people will never forget what God did in their lives. There are millions that can testify to this, but there's also people that become bitter at God because He did not answer something the way they wanted it. God, why did you do this to me? Why did you bring this into my life? I've been guilty of that. I'm not going to deny this past year was an extremely rough year, uh, physically, mentally, spiritually. When you have a doctor say to you, and my wife was sitting there and he says, Tad, listen, he says, what happened last year, you'll double this year if we don't get this under control. I don't have a desire for that. (laughs) That's no fun. I say, Lord, why, why are you doing this to me? But you know what? I have to accept his answer. I don't know why bad things happen to good people. But I do know this. Bitterness burns the bridge to forgiveness, but bitterness will also remove us from a tremendous blessing. Instead of saying, God, you just show me. God, whatever you want, it'll cause you to miss out. Where should you be if you're, if, if you're, and let me say this, and, and, and at no disrespect, listen, I'm angry at God. Well, how can anybody be angry at God? But there are times in our life where really we could say, I'm frustrated with what's going on. Why is this taking place in my life? Where should you find yourself? In the house of God? In your Bible? Around godly people? Never be afraid to reach out and say, listen, can you pray for me? I had a pastor friend that said, "Uh, hey, I'm having surgery in a little while. Would you pray for me? Removing a tumor off his thyroid. And they removed the tumor and there was one little spot that was cancerous. But the doctor said, listen, we got it all. You don't have to have any treatment at all. Man, I prayed for him. But we should never become bitter to a God that's given us everything. You see that they invited him there for the provisions of of life and these events. And he took care of every single need. Verse 11, he provided that which pertained to the faith. Not only that to the flesh. God cares about your flesh, but also your faith. And it says in verse 11, his disciples believed on him. Your faith is never misplaced when it is put in the Lord Jesus Christ. If we display the faith of a mustard seed in each and every one of our trials of life, the Lord will help us. He provided that which pertained to the future. Look at verse 11. It says, This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth His glory. And His disciples believed on Him, but manifested His glory. You see, when you see Jesus come through in your hour of crisis, it'll do something for you. It'll strengthen your faith and give you hope for tomorrow. Let me give you an illustration, Bible illustration. How many of you know the feeding of the 5,000, John chapter 6, 1 through 13? And, and, and we won't read it, but the disciples are filled with doubt. He says, what do we have? We have this. He said, okay, set everybody down and take. And, and he bro- broke it. He blessed it. And he said, take it to them. They doubted the Lord Jesus Christ. But did he fulfill his promise? Everybody ate and they collected all these baskets. Then you jump over to Matthew or to to, to Matthew chapter 15 in the feeding of the 4,000. Now it was more than 5,000, more than 4,000 here. You don't find the disciples doubting at all. They just did exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ had commanded them. Why? They had seen Jesus do a tremendous work. When you see God move in your life, you're going to trust Him in future events as well. God did it in the past, He's done it in the present, and I know that He's going to do it in the future as well. 
So this feast was to show the disciples also that I am God. I'm the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Jehovah. And so when you look at this, uh, uh, the future of your life, each and every time you call upon God, He is going to be there. You see, when you see Jesus come through for you today, how many would agree you have hope for tomorrow? I, I couldn't imagine being unsaved and going through trials and going through things with no hope. I mentioned a few minutes ago that a funeral is easier than a wedding. Now, I love weddings. Don't get me wrong. I love to see the life of two young people as they begin a new chapter in their life. And, and you learn new things, and at weddings you hear things, and some I've incorporated that, you know, if you would help me out, help this young couple out. They want to live their life for God, so please help them live their life for God. Don't bring any temptation into their life and you encourage them. But in a funeral situation, many times there's no hope or they're looking for an answer. And you can say, listen, I know the God of peace. I know the God of comfort. If you look at John 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. We can trust in God to help us. He's going to see you through this. But if you have a desire to see the Lord Jesus Christ like your loved one, like your friend, then here's what you have to do. You have to put your faith and trust in Him. You say, what if the person went to hell? They'll still see Christ. But that person would desire for you to be in heaven. Now, I don't bring that part into a funeral service. As I've mentioned, I just say they've entered their just reward. But they're looking for hope. I'm glad I have hope. I'm glad I have the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, He is the Word of God. Why? Because He is God. But He's also the Son of Man. Why? Because He's 100% man as well. He's the God man. See, what I want you to think about and take home this morning of course, is salvation. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, if there's never been a moment in time and you've said, Lord, come into my heart and save me, that, of course, is number one. But the other thing is Jesus is tied to the events of your life. He is not just some remote supernatural being who's totally removed from you. He is part of your life. If you're saved, the Bible says He indwells us at the moment of salvation. God Himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit lives within me. I need to make sure that He's part of every area of our life. I read something the other day or watched and how many of you with small children, you have them help you with something. The boys, when they were young, uh, Brandon was more into mechanics and, and getting his hands dirty. Tad was books. So I had to make him, hey, you need to come out and help me with this. And, but I found something. It slowed me down. And maybe that was the point. Slow down and enjoy the moments that you have with them. Maybe that's what we need to do with the Lord sometimes. Just slow down and just enjoy what God has given to us. Children want to be a part of your life. Your babies want to follow you around. And, and uh, Tad came the other day and Addie, she met him at the door and was so excited. And, and he hugged her and, and he turned and walked to his vehicle and she broke right down bawling. And Grammy said, it's all right. He's just going to his vehicle. He'll be right back. She thought, he th she thought that he was leaving her. I don't know what Grammy did to her that day. I wasn't there most of the day, so it must have been her. They have a desire to spend time with their parents. We ought to have that desire to spend time. But God doesn't mind slowing down and taking care of every one of our needs. Whether it is spiritual or physical, God wants to be a part of your life. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, your goodness, your word. Lord, I pray that you help us to just 
grasp that thought that you want to be a part of our life, that you want to be a part of every part of our life, every event of our life. And when you're a part of our life, things just seem to work out. Lord, I pray that you'll be with each and every person here this morning. Maybe someone here does not know you as their personal Savior. Maybe someone here is going through some trials. Or maybe everything's going well, but they just need a fresh, renewed touch of you upon their lives. Lord, I pray you'll meet each and every need. If you're here this morning, heads are bowed, eyes are closed, nobody's looking around. Maybe someone here this morning say, Pastor, I do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. There's never been a day, never been a time when I've received Christ. But I'd like to know. I won't embarrass you, I won't call you down, but I'll pray for you. Would you let me pray for you? If there's one like that this morning, say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I don't know. I don't understand. I think I am. Maybe I am, but I don't fully know. Maybe someone here this morning is saying, Pastor, I'm just going through some things in my life. I just so desperately need the Lord to just come in and take care of that problem. Dear and Father, I pray that each and every person here, you will touch their lives and just become anew. Just refresh them, comfort them, restore them. We love you. We pray in your precious and holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. If you would take your song.